The windows of heaven. We'll just sing this little chorus twice. The windows of heaven are open. The blessings are falling tonight. There's joy, joy, joy in my heart since Jesus made everything right. I gave him my old tattered garment. He gave me a robe of pure white. I'm feasting on manna from heaven, and that's why I'm happy tonight. The windows of heaven are open, the blessings are falling tonight. There's joy, joy, joy in my heart, since Jesus made everything right. I gave him my old tattered garment, he gave me a robe of pure white. I'm feasting on manna from heaven, and that's why I'm happy tonight. Amen. Thank you, Father, for your provision and for opening those windows of heaven to provide blessings to your people. God be with us today. I pray, God, that you would enter into this room, Lord. Give us proper and sound preaching, Lord, not because of anything I have in and of myself, but because your Spirit did a great work. Help us, God, to hear and be receptive to what you want to teach us today. We'll give you all the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, go in your Bibles to Deuteronomy 22. Deuteronomy 22, continuing our study in Deuteronomy. We'll begin by reading that whole chapter, beginning in verse 1, Deuteronomy 22. Thou shalt not see thy brother's ox or his sheep go astray and hide thyself from them. Thou shalt in any case bring them again unto thy brother. And if thy brother be not nigh unto thee, or if thou know him not, then thou shalt bring it unto thine own house, and it shall be with thee until thy brother seek after it and thou shalt restore it to him again. In like manner thou shalt do with his ass, and so thou shalt do with his raiment, and with all lost thing of thy brothers, which he hath lost, and thou hast found, shalt thou do likewise. Thou mayest not hide thyself. Thou shalt not see thy brother's ass or his ox fall down by the way, and hide thyself from them. Thou shalt surely help him to lift them up again. The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment, for all that do so are abomination unto the Lord thy God. If a bird's nest chance to be before thee in the way, in any tree or on the ground, whether they be young ones or eggs, and the dam sitting upon the young or upon the eggs, thou shalt not take the dam with the young. But thou shalt in any wise let the dam go, and take the young to thee, that it may be well with thee, and that thou mayest prolong thy days. When thou buildest a new house, then thou shalt make a battlement for thy roof, that thou bring not blood upon thine house. If any man fall from, or thou, thou bring not blood upon thine house, if any man fall from thence. Thou shalt not sow thy vineyard with diverse seeds, lest the seed of thy, lest the fruit of thy seed which thou hast sown, and the fruit of thy vineyard be defiled. Thou shalt not plow with an ox and an ass together. Thou shalt not wear a garment of diverse sorts, as of woolen and linen together. Thou shalt not make thee fringes upon the four quarters of thy vesture, wherewith thou coverest thyself. If any man take a wife, and go in unto her, and hate her, and give occasion of speech against her, and bring up an evil name upon her, and say, I took this woman, and when I came to her, I found her not a maid, then shalt the father of the damsel and her mother take and bring forth the tokens of the damsel's virginity unto the elders of the city in the gate. And the damsel's father shall say unto the elders, I gave my daughter unto this man to wife, and he hateth her. And lo, he hath given occasion of speech against her, saying, I found not thy daughter a maid, and yet these are the tokens of my daughter's virginity. 
And they shall spread the cloth before the elders of the city. And the elders of that city shall take that man and chastise him. And they shall immerse him in an hundred shekels of silver and give them unto the father of the damsel because he hath brought up an evil name upon a virgin of Israel and she shall be his wife. He may not put her away all his days. But if this thing be true and the tokens of the virginity be not found for the damsel... Then they shall bring out the damsel to the door of her father's house, and the men of her city shall stone her with stones that she die, because she hath wrought folly in Israel to play the whore in her father's house. So shalt thou put away evil from among you. If a man be found lying with a woman, married to an husband, then they shall both of them die, both the man that lay with the woman and the woman. So shalt thou put away evil from Israel." If a damsel that is a virgin be betrothed unto an husband, and a man find her in the city and lie with her, then ye shall bring them both out unto the gate of that city, and ye shall stone them with stones that they die. The damsel, because she cried not, being in the city, and the man, because he hath humbled his neighbor's wife, so thou shalt put away evil from among you. But if a man, be, if a man find a betrothed damsel in the field, and the man force her and lie with her, then the man only that lay with her shall die. But unto the damsel thou shalt do nothing. There is in the damsel no sin worthy of death. For as when a man riseth against his neighbor and slayeth him, even so is this matter. For he found her in the field, and the betrothed damsel cried, and there was none to save her. If a man find a damsel that is a virgin, which is not betrothed, and lay hold on her, and lie with her, and they be found, then the man that lie with her shall give unto the damsel's father fifty shekels of silver, and she shall be his wife. Because he hath humbled her, he may not put her away all his days. A man shall not take his father's wife, nor discover his father's skirt. So here in Deuteronomy, another chapter thrown our way, that deals with scriptures that are often used by the unbelievers and the atheists alike to mock the word of God. These are some things that are maybe a little bit unclear as far as area of judgment goes, but as we discussed last week, we need to by default believe that God is right in all cases and trust him by faith. And sometimes just praying about these scriptures over the course of time, and maybe even bouncing off ideas with your friends, as was my experience this week, you can come to the truth of these scriptures, as I did about verse 10 through 14 of last week's in Deuteronomy 21. It took a few days, but I realized that that's actually not the case that I thought it was, but it's something else, and so we can talk about that a little bit later. Um, but, as I did last week, I chose to just kind of leave that aside and move on, and we should do that in our own Bible reading. There's nothing wrong with that. If you come to something you don't necessarily understand or agree with or does, you don't get it, say a quick prayer to God, ask Him for enlightenment, ask Him to give you understanding when is good for Him, and let it alone, and then move on. There's lots of Bible to learn from. There's lots of scriptures that you can understand and you can get clearly at face value, don't get bogged down with things. And I've seen this too many times. I've done it to myself where I'm really getting momentum going in Bible reading and then something stops me and confuses me and confounds me. And where I might have gotten a great revelation down the line, I stopped and I, and I lingered at something that proved to me to be of no value because I was just kind of spinning my tires and not really getting anything out of it. And that was just me trying to understand better than God. Maybe God just doesn't want me to know these things right away. And so he kind of puts it off and then moves me on to something else. And that's fine. We should be okay with that. Now, um, in dealing with Deuteronomy chapter 22, we find right away it says, Thou shalt not see thy brother's ox or his sheep go astray and hide thyself from them. Thou shalt in any case bring them again unto Thy brother. Keep your finger there and you can go with me to Exodus 23, just a little bit to the left. Exodus 23. We're going to find the opposite case, essentially, in Exodus chapter 23. See, this says, look after thy brother when his ox or his sheep or his property goes astray. Over in Exodus chapter 23, beginning in verse 4, the Bible says, thou shalt not countenance or starting with verse 4, my, my apologies. 
If thou meet thine enemy's ox or his ass going astray, thou shalt surely bring it back unto him again. If thou see the ass of him that hateth thee lying under his burden and wouldest forbear to help him, thou shalt surely help with him. Thou shalt not rest the judgment. It continues and says of the poor in his cause, but just in general, we ought not rest judgment. Here's a case where whether it's your enemy or whether it's someone beloved to you, your brother, you ought to treat them the same way. Treat others as you would like to be treated is, is the named golden rule of Christ. We've got to treat others the way we would like to be treated. And so here, our judgment in a scenario is not just reserved for whether or not the person is nice to us or not nice to us, our friend or not our friend, a brother or enemy. We ought to do the same thing in judgment, and that's if their sheep go astray, their ox go astray, keep it and hold it for them and return it unto them. The enemy, the same as if it were a brother of yours. Keep your finger in Deuteronomy. We're going to go to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. We have Jesus' teaching on this. Matthew chapter 5. And in verse 43, it says, Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. Matthew 5, verse 44. Okay, so this is what has been said. This doesn't say that this is scripture here, and some people get confused. Oh, the Old Testament said, You shall, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. No, the Bible never said that. The Bible actually, we just saw in Deuteronomy and Exodus, said love them both. Right? Here, though, Jesus says, many have been saying this. You've heard it said, you know, do good to those which do good to you and hate those that are hating you. No, but Jesus is going to contradict this and teach his pure heart in the matter, which actually is revealed in the Old Testament scriptures. Verse 44 says, but I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh, look at this, his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? And that's probably where they heard this from, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Verse 47, And if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans the same. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. The complete Christian is one that puts rain on the just and the unjust. Puts a, a shed of light on the just and on the unjust. The same. Loves their enemy and loves their brethren in the same way and in the same fashion. Love your enemy. Someone makes an enemy of you, you love them. You do your best to love them and to show love for them just as if they were your brother. Back in Deuteronomy chapter 22. As if they were your own flesh, in fact. Love them as you love yourself. And I don't know about you, but I love me a lot. I love me some me, okay? So that means I should be showing that amount of love for others. And that's a hard thing apart from the Spirit of God, isn't it? God is one that empowers us to do that type of love and to show that type of love. Christ loved those that crucified him. Christ loved those that beat him, spat on him, mocked him, ridiculed him, drug him to the cross and put him on that thing and nailed him. He did that out of love for those people that hated him, right? And we need to show that love by letting God's love flow through us. In Deuteronomy 22, and beginning in verse 2, it says, And if thy brother be not nigh unto thee, or, thou, or if thou know him not, then thou shalt bring it unto thine own house, and it shall be with thee until thy brother seek after it, and thou shalt restore it to him again. So this is like a hide-and-seek, or a, um, a lost-and-found case. You bring it back, and you keep it with you. Verse 3, it says, In like manner shalt thou do with his ass, and so shalt thou do with his raiment, and with all lost thing of thy brothers, which he hath lost, and thou hast found, shalt thou do likewise, thou mayest not hide thyself. And so whenever you find anything that doesn't belong to you, first thing, find out if you can get it to your brother, your neighbor, whoever it is. If you can't, bring it back and have it there available for such a time when they come and look for it, right? We, Caleb and I find things all the time. This is a, a, a light story about this. We find little dinky cars at the park. And our deal is we ask everybody in the park if it belongs to them. If nobody claims it, we keep it in his little vehicle. And then every time we come to the park, we're bringing that toy with us. So if somebody sees it and says, oh, hey, that's mine, we're ready to restore it unto them, right? That's just, that's just good, um, a good principle that here we find in the scriptures. Verse 4, it continues, Thou shalt not see thy brother's ass or his ox 
fall down by the way and hide thyself from them, thou shalt surely help him to lift them up again. And the same is true for your enemy. If your enemy's ox or ass fall down into a ditch, don't hide thyself, help them out. Obviously, this is a little bit of a different context. Our ox or our ass, that might be, in modern terms, our vehicles, right? Someone's bike breaks down, their car breaks down. We might be able to offer help in those situations. Of course, of course, be safe because you're not supposed to just stop on the corner of highways. But if you get an opportunity, help somebody out, whether they're a friend or an enemy, with their vehicle issues. I was certainly thankful that I had some help with my vehicle issues this week from a brother of mine. Verse 5 continues on, and it says this. The woman, we're going to change direction a little bit, shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment, for all that do so are abomination unto the Lord thy God. And so this one is, is not that unclear, actually. No, um, it's basically and clearly presenting that there is a clothing article that belongs to a man and there are clothing articles that belong to a woman. You're not supposed to wear that which pertaineth unto another. Now, my position on this, and first of all, it's way easier generally in the day that we live in to just decide this upon a man. If you see a man dressed up as a woman, you can tell it right away. Whereas women's clothing, it's, it's started to blend the lines, hasn't it? There, there's, there's clothing articles that are, that are drawing lines and blurring lines, and it's, it's not clear and distinct. Now, if a man comes out in high heels and a, and a dress and lipstick on, you're like, whoa, freak. Like, that's, that is abomination. He is abomination. But then there's, there's, there's women that come out in maybe like, like a pantsuit that looks just like mine, and, and people have blurred the lines and said, okay, well, that's okay. Well, what makes that okay but not the other? And I would say, though, when it comes to this area of judgment, that people need to come to their conclusions based on not through the compulsion of men, but by the compelling of God or conviction of spirit, okay? So my experience was that when my wife was saved, I was saved a little bit before her, and I had already learned some of these truths. But, I mean, we were, we were saved from, from the old world, as worldly as it gets, the, the rock and roll lifestyle. And so she had a closet full of tight blue jeans, right? Okay, now, I didn't, wisely go in there and just start taking these things and throwing them out and saying, you're going to dress this way from now on and enforcing myself. But rather, I had to give place for God to work that into her life. And then one day she comes to me and she's like, hey, in my closet, I have all of these things that I don't feel are right for me to wear. Will you help me to draw them out and to dispose of them? And I was happy to do so, of course, but that was by the compelling of God and and the conviction of the Spirit and not by the compulsion of men. Not just because somebody told her to do so. Not just because someone mandated that that would be the case. No. When, When God makes a change in a person, especially when it comes to something so personal as their attire, because honestly, we say a lot about ourselves by what we wear, don't we? You are talking about that the other day when you are in the bus station. People came and talked to you, and they are like, this man must be a church guard. He must be a Christian. Well, why did they say that? Was it because of his haircut? Was it because of his, his, his like slightly scruffy beard or what? No, it was because he was in a suit on a Sunday, right? His attire said something about him. And this is what attire needs to do. And this is why it's like, not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, and not wear that which pertaineth unto a woman, if you're that opposite sex. Because it ought to be clear what you are and who you are. There ought to be a, a, a clear and present distinction. And the Bible is clear here that all that cross those lines and cross dress are an abomination. Look at the end of that verse. It says, for all that do so are abomination unto the Lord thy God. It doesn't say that what they're doing is abomination. It says that they are abomination. Okay? A guy with a beard and a dress, okay? That's abomination. That's clear to people, right? Lady in a pantsuit, maybe that's not all clear. But this is where I think the distinction biblically is, okay? The clearest item that is clearly for man and clearly for woman is, is made plain on the, the washroom doors, isn't it? Right? We, we know which washroom to go to because there's a triangle shaped like a dress and then there's a straight legs for the man, okay? Now, I would say that that's the clearest distinction, okay? That's just black and white. We don't, we don't find gray area when we go to the washroom doors, do we? It's just black and white. It's very clear. Now, that's the bottom line distinction, but 
I would say also that there's some gray area. And even culturally speaking, because I saw at the park the other day as I was meditating upon these things, some um, Indian ladies that were out and they were wearing a, a long coat and these pants things that went way out and flowed and you could, unless you looked, you couldn't tell that there was material on both legs. But I didn't look at them and say, oh, they're, they're wearing that which pertaineth unto a man. You know what I mean? The Indian garb for their ladies, it looks very feminine. It looks very nice. It looks very pretty. But it is what we would call pants, I believe, right? There's a distinction there, though. You know what I mean? And so while I believe that the easiest distinction, okay, men wear pants, women wear dress, I believe that there's also some lines. But, okay, when it comes to serving God and when it comes to the, the commandments of God, he is often black and white. And so we need to make sure that our heart is right in this. And this is why I say that this has to be the compelling of God and the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Some people, some, some women wear pants in the house. Some people wear pants when they go and do certain tasks, okay? I'm, I'm not getting on people for what they have worked out with God, but it's got to be worked out with God. And we want to make sure that in no case are we graying the area, right? No case are we kind of, uh, I don't know, is that the clothing of a man? Is that the clothing of a woman? I don't know. I mean, you just want to make sure that it's clear and it's distinct. Because, because this is the thing that is a big problem in our society, is blurring the lines. Who's the head of the house? Who's, who, who's, who should be leading? Who should be in charge? Who should be caring for the children at home? Who, who, is, who is in charge of each area of the home? Even the home itself is in under attack, Right? We have, we, have, we have women stealing the kids and then trying, to, trying to, to rule the house because they got a divorce and they won the settlement. and they, you know, Now they're the boss of the own house, but they're putting the kids in don't care, and they're wearing the pants when they go to the, the good job so that they can care for them, right? And then we have, we have the men that just want to sit at home and play video games and be the stay-at-home dad while the wife goes off and does those things. And there, there's so many lines that are being blurred these days, so we want to be clear, okay? And the Bible here, I believe, is very clear. It's as clear as the washroom door, okay? Not mean to be graphic, but it's clear. Don't wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a woman put on a man's garment. A man shall not put on a woman's garment. You just got to make sure that that distinction is clear. Why? Because God is clear. Look at, I mean, look at that command and that charge at the end. All that do so are abomination. I don't want to tread the line of being an abomination unto God. So I'm just going to make sure that whatever I'm wearing, I'm pleasing unto him. So I'm going to make sure that I go to God and, you know, walk through my closet. Hey, you know, I've, I've got some things, had some things in the past that have been, have been strange, right? Been on borderline, right? I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to be ashamed to admit it. I used to be cool and in a rock band and I used to wear the skinny jeans. Okay. That was the trend there. That was what was cool. Those are gone now. You know what? I got like, I got like Wrangler jeans that hang off of me and I can work in them and move in them. But when there was that time, that's what was cool. And that's what I did. Now I'm not going to blur those lines and bring them, but I don't also think that skinny jeans are necessarily that which pertains unto a woman. They're just not unbecoming of me. So what am I going to do with this? Well, maybe if I get them not so skinny, I can still wear them. No, just, just throw them out. Okay, get some, get some, get some Levi's or get something, something a little more, little more manly. I don't know. That's, that's what you got to do. And, and, that's, and that's my charge for this. Make sure God leads you. Verse 6, we'll continue on. I ate a whole bunch of time there. If a bird's nest chance to be before thee in the way in any tree or on the ground, whether they be young ones or eggs or dam sitting upon the young or upon the eggs, thou shalt not take the dam with the young, but thou shalt in any wise let the dam go and take the young to thee, that it may be well with thee, and that thou mayest prolong thy days. So this is basically saying, hey, let the fertile dam go. If you're going to take from the eggs, take the young, take the eggs out of the nest, and that's fine. You can use those, eat those, Take advantage of those. God provided those for you, but let the dam go. This dam is fertile. She will go off and she will have more babies. And, and maybe these ones won't, you know, come across you and your appetite. And, and, and then what the Bible says here is that thou mayest prolong thy days. This is just good principle not to be selfish and just take everything. Because if you just start eating everything, you'll be destroyed <laughs> for, for your own foolishness. You need to allow for that to take place. The, the, uh, the life to go forward as a result of you only taking what God prescribes. 
verse 8, it says, When thou buildest a new house, then thou shalt make a battlement for thy roof, that thou bringest not blood upon thine house if any man fall from thence. Does anyone know what a battlement is? It's like in a castle, when you go and you, you have, it goes up, it goes down, it goes up, it goes down, it goes up, it goes down, right? And that would typically be for the archer shooting or being able to sight through it. But then there's also a natural blockade on either side. And that's there for the purpose of both allowing for you to get through that gap and see down, but also there's a natural barricade there so someone doesn't fall down. Here God's giving us, you know, some building code, right? Because if it was just flat everywhere, then chances are somebody may not see the edge when it's coming or they're walking backwards and, and they could just fall off that thing. And the Bible says that blood would be upon thine house if a man fall from thence. So here's the command that there would be regularly spaced openings which would provide both protection and access. And, and nowadays we just, we just basically put the guardrail around the whole thing. But it seems like it's suitable to have guardrail, nothing, guardrail, nothing, guardrail, nothing. A battlement set up like that um, just to be safe. Verse 9 continues and says, Thou shalt not sow thy, seed, or sow thy vineyard with diverse seeds, lest the fruit of thy seed which thou hast sown and the fruit of thy vineyard be defiled. Defiled means sullied or marred or spoiled. Now, first and foremost, in a practical standpoint, this makes it very hard to harvest. If you have half of one type of fruit and half of another type of fruit, you're not going to be able to harvest it in the same way. You're going to, what, be sorting it kind of as you go through? No, but it should be easy where you just go through and you're harvesting all one thing and you're bringing it all in the same store in that way. So there's one reason. But also, God is not the author of confusion. In another place, he charges, do all things decently and in order. Okay, so that's all things. Your house shouldn't be a mess. Your car shouldn't be a mess. Your, your, your planning at work shouldn't be a mess. Your life should do all things decently and in order. We ought to be decent and orderly people. And so this is why God says, don't be planting mixed seed. It's, it's like, a, it's like a, a principle that applies to our whole life, and it can stretch out in that, in that manner. Um, he wants us to be ordered people, and, and the same is true even if you're just planting seeds. There shouldn't be any confusion. And actually, that by extension goes back to what we talked about in verse 5, about not wearing that which pertaineth. God is just a God of order, decently, and in order is what he prescribes here. And this is what he's highlighting in verse 9 and in another place below. Verse 10, Thou shalt not plow with an ox and an ass together. Now what's happening there? The ox is the big, burly creature. The ass is a little bit smaller and, and, and not as strong, right? So what do you think is going to happen when they're plying together, right? He's going to drag him or they're going to go in circles because one's pulling harder than the other. It's just, it's going to be confusion. Do all things decently in order. God is not the author of confusion. You know what? This is also a practical application that carries into the New Testament when God says, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. That's the same thing as an ox and an ass plowing together. What's going to happen? Confusion. What's going to happen? One's going to do a whole bunch of work and the other isn't. Or they're going to work in, in circles. and it's not, They're not going to get anywhere. The, the end goal will not be achieved because they're plowing unequally yoked together. And that's, and that's ultimately what he's talking about here in a practical sense. One will always pull harder. One will always weigh the other one down. There will always be confusion when you set up um, a plowing in this situation or a, a yoking together in this type of situation. Verse 11, it says, Thou shalt not wear a garment of diverse sorts as of woolen and linen together, okay? So this is animal and, and plant-based, okay? Here in our economy, we have typically animal and, and, and polycarbons, like we make them out of plastic, 50% poly, 50% cotton. So we have plant and then poly, right? We mix them together. But God, again, I believe, not just on a practical sense, because we'd be a lot healthier, I think, if we didn't have all these poly, or these polycarbons on us all the time, these things um, they they release their own chemicals. They're 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 poisonous unto us. They probably cause a lot of the cancers and decay that we have as a result. If we could just always wear a hundred percent woolen or a hundred percent cotton, I think we'd be a lot healthier for it. But you know what? That doesn't make any money, right? And or or it will, but you have to pay the highest of levels. But they like to ship in all this stuff from China, mix the materials, and then sell it to us for cheap. But wisdom is here. We ought not mix those things together. And again, this is the, the age-old tale that God wants separation. 
He wants distinction. He wants decency and an order to be done in all things. And here we are again, uh, just another illustration in the practical sense of how we ought not mix these things together. They don't mix right. They don't work the same way. There's different, um, I don't know, I could get into all the science behind it, but I barely even understand it, and I work in it. Textiles, right? These, these things, when interwoven, don't work together if they're different. Can two walk together except they be agreed, right? The Bible says. So here we have another application that you can take something that people will be like, oh, this is just like an obscure, a weird, why is God commanding this? And I guess you're going to hell then because you wear mixed garments, hmm? right? And they'll attack you with that and those kinds of things. No, there's just good practical teaching there that God has all sorts of New Testament examples for what these applications are. And I think that's what the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Peter and others like him and Jesus himself brought forward when they were teaching people. Okay, yeah, for us, it's, it's not very practical to talk about mixing seeds necessarily or, or plowing with an ox and an ass together. We don't comprehend that. But what is the spiritual significance of that? Well, we can go to the New Testament and learn what the spiritual significance is, and that's what we did. Be not unequally yoked. Do things decently in order. Can two walk together except they be agreed? All of these practical teachings come out of Deuteronomy. Amen. Verse 12 Thou shalt make the fringes upon the four quarters of thy vesture wherewith thou coverest thyself. So what is the practical benefit here? Well, that, that you're, you're covered. You're, it's, it's, it's good to be covered. And we'll continue on. Verse 13. If any man take a wife and go in unto her and hate her, and give occasion of speech against her, and bring up an evil name upon her, and say, I took this woman, and when I came to her, I found her not a maid. So the hatred that this man had, it says in verse 13, caused him to bring up an evil report upon her. Okay. Now, I will always say this, if someone is truly evil, why is it needful then for him to lie about what she did or what she is? But that is what happens here. There's two scenarios that play out. One is where the man says something that's a lie and what should happen. And the next we'll read about is when somebody says something that is true and how they ought to deal with it. So here, the first case, I'll just give it away, is an evil report. Look at, look at verse 15. It says, Then shalt the father of the damsel and her mother... Take and bring forth the tokens of the damsel's virginity unto the elders of the city in the gate. And the damsel's father shall say unto the elders, I gave my daughter to this man to wife, and he hateth her. Now the confidence of the father here is such that he comes and he says, I gave my daughter. So he is very well of what he is giving, right? He's aware of the fact that this is his daughter, and this is what I gave to the man, and lo, he hateth it. Verse 17 continues and said, And lo, he hath given occasions of speech against her, saying, I found not thy daughter a maid. And yet, these are the tokens of my daughter's virginity, and they shall spread the cloth before the elders of the city. Token simply means the sign of the virginity. Okay, this is proof. So the father comes and says, Look, this man married my daughter. Now he's saying all of these slanderous things. But I have proof that she was a maid. And I have proof that she is my daughter and she is exactly as I presented her. And the way he would have presented her is a virgin. The way he would have presented her is chaste and, and, and fit for, for any man that would, that would want her. This is what the father presented. And lo, the occasion comes of speech against her and he takes great offense to it because he's been offended not only that his daughter's been attacked but that his integrity's been attacked. This is what I presented to you, and now you're going to slander what I presented to you. So verse 18, it says, And the elders of the city shall take that man and chastise him. Okay, so they're going, they're going to scourge him and punish him. Okay, in verse 19, it says, And they shall immerse him in an hundred shekels of silver. So an immerse, that's, that means in a punishment by a fine. 
here in a hundred shekels of silver and give them unto the father of the damsel because he hath brought up an evil name upon a virgin of Israel and she shall be his wife. He may not put her away all the day. So it was proven that she was exactly as promised. A virgin, chaste, daughter of Israel, ready to be received as a wonderful wife and yet this man had these evil things to say because of his hatred for her. The punishment was chastisement and a hundred shekels being about $300 US for silver, meaning it's about a $30,000 fine, which he had to pay over to the father as a result of his own slanderous and wicked behavior and attacks on the father's daughter. And that's hurtful both to the daughter and that's hurtful both to the father. I'm sure that fine is even no consolation for what takes place. But nevertheless, this man was still then expected to stay in his marriage vows, though he had done these things. And so that's got to be a hard thing because the Bible says, husbands, love your wives. So now he has to, he has to overcome all this. I don't know if he thought it was a get out of, get out of jail free card and he was just going to start over and take a new wife or what he was trying to do here, but it wasn't right. The punishment was fit and God, God has it so, and he needs to carry on with that promise of vow that he had made unto the wife and unto the father and before God Almighty. He has to continue on in that thing. Okay, so we continue on after this and it's because the Bible says in verse 19, he hath brought up an evil name upon a virgin of Israel. So we see then that a virgin is a very precious thing and so it's important that, that, that young men and young women keep themselves chaste. We don't put enough significance on that. Um, and, and fathers, when you, when you grow up and you become a father, it's important that you present your son and your daughter in that case. And this father, he was assured of the fact that his family members was chaste when he offered them. His children were chaste when he offered them to be a husband or to be a wife. He was sure of that because he was diligent to raise them in that way. And that's, that's an important lesson. The virginity of, of a child as they grow up and to be a young adult and as they seek to get married is, is of utmost importance unto God. And here he presents why and also gives indication of what would be done if it isn't kept. Verse 20, we're going to continue on. And it says, But if this thing be true, and the tokens or the proof of virginity be not found for the damsel, then they shall bring out the damsel to the door of her father's house, and the men of her city shall stone her with stones that she die, because she hath wrought folly in Israel to play the whore in her father's house. So shalt thou put away evil from among you. And so God, again, reemphasizing how important this is. Basically, the scenario is this, is that the father went and he said, look, she is what I said she was, and it was found out that she wasn't. Well, what does that mean? That means that the father was not aware of something that the daughter was doing. So she was running around, and what the Bible says here is that she was wrought, working folly, wrought folly in Israel, playing the whore in her father's house and doing all of these things, fornicating and the like, behind her father's back. And so the husband that took her received the wrong reward. She was put to get death, and then therefore that husband was able to go on and, and marry another wife because he wasn't given what he thought he would, was expecting to receive. Though the father was confident, the daughter obviously, in this case, snuck around. Okay, verse 22 continues, If a man be found lying with a woman married to an husband, then they shall both of them die, both the man that lie with the, wom lie with the woman and the woman, so shalt thou put away evil from Israel. Okay, keep your finger there, and I'm going to go to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. Now, this is a case that the Pharisees actually brought to Jesus' attention. And I'll read that again as you turn to John chapter 8. It says, If a man be found lying with a woman married to an husband, then they shall both of them die. Both the man that lie with the woman and the woman, so shalt thou put away evil from Israel. In the case of John chapter 8, we found Jesus went into the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. Okay, so they found her taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now, Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? Now look at this. This they said, tempting him, 
that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. And so he was aware, of course, being the son of God, that they were trying to tempt him with this question. They brought the woman and they said she was taken in the very act. God's law, Moses' law says she should be stoned. But what sayest thou? Verse 7, it says, So when they continued asking, right, because he ignored them, he lift up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. So he says, go ahead and stone her, if you're sinless. <laughs> so they're like, oh, uh, what do I do? I, I, mm. And then this, I like this. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Now, I don't know what he wrote. I don't know if he wrote names. I don't know if he wrote addresses. I don't know. Whatever he wrote, Verse 9, it says, And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even to the last, and Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. And so whatever he wrote, and on top of what he said, it caused them to be convicted by their own conscience, and say, yeah, I'm not stoning this woman, drops it and walks away. But what was missing here, and why Jesus didn't just outright stone her with stones, okay, First of all, they were under Roman authority and therefore they had to be subject unto the powers that were at that time. They weren't able to do all of their Jewish things because they were in occupation. They were, under, they were a religious group under the occupation of a monarchy. Kind of like we're a religious group as Christians under the occupation of our, our government here in Canada, right? We have to do things a little bit differently. We can't be going around stoning people with stones, right? But on top of that, Jesus... Notice that they brought a woman taken in adultery, but what does the text say? It says both of them may die. Both the man and the woman. What was missing? The man. If you took him in the very act, where's the man? He's missing. My hunch is that perhaps the man was one of their guys, one of their boys, right? They took the woman in adultery. Let's get rid of her. This guy's going to get caught. We want to cover for our buddy. This happens in so many false religions today, doesn't it? They try to cover for one another. But they brought the woman only. Let's dispose of the evidence. And Jesus says, you know, maybe he wrote, Rabbi so-and-so. And they're like, he knows. Never mind. Run away. I don't know what the case is. But whatever he wrote and whatever he said, it was enough for them to... To, to let her go. And so Jesus, I believe, was, was right to say, hey, if you're without sin, cast a stone at her. And he was also right in that he said, hey, you know, he was essentially saying, where's the other? This is not what Moses' law said. Moses' law said both of them ought to be put to death in this case. Okay? Going back to Deuteronomy. We're there in Deuteronomy 22. And in verse 23. If a damsel that is a virgin be betrothed unto an husband, and a man find her in the city and lie with her, then ye shall bring them both out into the gate of the city, and ye shall stone them with stones that they die. The damsel, because she cried not, being in the city, and the man, because he hath humbled his neighbor's wife, so thou shalt put away evil from among you. Again, the goal here is to put away evil from among you. If this is punished even once, it's never going to happen again in the vicinity. A lot of people see these judgments as they take place in the gates. And people will be walking in and seeing two people stoned with stones and they're going to say, what's happening here? Adultery. I'm not committing adultery. I don't want that to happen. These, these are the types of things that aren't just happening all the time. Okay? This is why these laws are enacted this way. And this is why these laws seem so extreme. I figure that if these were properly enacted, they would be few and far between in rarities. Right? They would make sure that everybody saw they, they would make sure that, you know, if, 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 I was, if I was a dad, I would probably, you know, take my son or if he was at a right age or explain it to him. Hey, we, you know why we don't see such and such anymore? This is what happened. Adultery. They were stoned with stones. Don't do that when you grow up, right? You would use that as a learning example. And that's exactly what it's there for. Now, here we see two things. First of all, that a betrothal is the same as a marriage. Look at that, betrothal. If a damsel that is a virgin, verse 23, be betrothed unto a husband. And at the end of verse 24, it says, and the man because he hath humbled his neighbor's wife. Okay, he was stoned to death. Okay, so that's, that's one and the same. They're, they're betrothed, they're engaged to be married. It's as good as being married. In other words, the promise was already made. It's just that the ring hasn't been put on the finger. There hasn't been that ceremony as we would look at it. Now, 
The problem in this scenario is that she cried not, okay? That's what it says. She was in the city, that's a key, and it said because she cried not, that's what her punishment made. That indicates that there was no dispute, there was no fight, that this was in fact consensual. She was committing adultery on her husband that was she was betrothed unto, and as a result, she committed full-blown adultery in this case. And therefore, she was put to death, and the man was put to death at the same time. Again as a quick and swift judgment, and because justice is not executed swiftly in the gates, therefore it is the heart of man fully set in them to do wickedly. Justice has to be done this way, because the hearts of men are deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. We need to see swift judgment take place if we're going to get anything right. And this is how God set it up in his economy. Continuing on in verse 25, it says, But if a man find a betrothed damsel in the field, so this is the difference. The first one was in the city, this is in the field. And the man force her, okay, and lie with her, then the man only that lay with her shall die. But the damsel thou shalt do nothing. There is, there is in the damsel no sin worthy of death. So it's in the field, and he forced her, it says, okay? Now the Bible says that the damsel did nothing wrong, and therefore she lives. Now what is the case? Modern vernacular, rape has taken place. It says... For, continuing in the second part of verse 26, For as when a man riseth against his neighbor and slayeth him, even so is this matter of rape. For he found her in the field, and the betrothed damsel cried, but there was none to save her. What a sad case this is. But it happens all the time. Where somebody, and unfortunately it can even happen in the cities now, right? Because you can, I don't know, I don't know what it is, but it, under darkness it's almost as if you're out in a field. The worst things happen after dark, and this is what, what happens, is these rapes take place, somebody cries out, and nothing is done. But the Bible is clear that it's as if when a man riseth against his neighbor and slayeth him, so is the case of a man raping a woman. This is a, a wicked and a heinous act. It, it's, it's, a, it's a sin against that woman so awful as, as manslaughter or murder. And, and the, the, the reason being is, is that this can absolutely ruin a person. It can ruin their life. It can ruin them psychologically. It can ruin them physically when these things take place. It can be that this woman could never conceive a child again. She could never properly love uh, a, another man because she's, she's, so, she's been so demented in her head about, about men in general. It can cause for, for the, because of the abuse, that she would just go in a far away direction from God and just, just get into those types of sins and Herself. It's just as if that woman was destroyed and slayed. It's a miracle if people get molested or raped and they turn out okay. It's so heinous, this type of sin against people. And so God has it so that, that he forced her. He did this deed. It's as bad as murder. It's so wicked. And he's put to death as a result. And at least, at least, at least, there would be some consolation for the woman in that case. But you know what the problem is in our day and age? is that when these rapes and molestations happen, the worst people get is a slap on the wrist and some jail time, and they're out again. And these people also have to live with the fact that their attacker, their abuser is still out there living their life, enjoying their life, maybe even doing the same wicked things to other people. You see why God's just and God is right? It, it, for the sake of the woman, just, just end that pervert's life. Put him to death. So at least there's some closure in that avenue. At least she knows that he won't go and do it to somebody else. At least she knows that he won't come at her again, right? But nevertheless, our, our, our world thinks that they know better than God, right? And so they, they, they let these people live. You know, at, at, at best, they'll put them on a list. And in the States, you can go on your phone and you can look up all the perverts and pedophiles in your neighborhood. In Canada, though, our, our prime minister made sure that that wasn't the case. One of the first things I believe that he did is just covered up that registry so that I can't even know if there's a pervert or a rapist living in my neighborhood because that would be, that would be mean to him to, to let that privacy of his out. We should be able to know. But the reason, the reason why sometimes they don't want them to know is there's, also, there, there's, there's this thing called, called justice that people like to take right. into their own hands. And, uh, and you know, I, I, I don't endorse it, but I, don't, I definitely don't frown upon it if somebody's young child or young daughter is hurt and harmed and mom or dad go and, 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 and take that life where the government refused to, um, they have a word for that. It's, it's mother's rage. You know, somebody hurts their child and uh, mom takes justice into their own hands. And, uh, and it happens. And it happens. But, you know, 
in a righteous and just nation, that wouldn't have to take place. The government would take care of it. It would be done. It would be over with. And at least that part of the healing could take place. And this is exactly what God expects and what God wants to take place in his world. Verse 28, it says, If a man find a damsel that is a virgin, which is not betrothed, and lay hold on her and lie with her, and they be found, then the man that lay with her shall give unto the damsel's father fifty shekels of silver, and she shall be his wife. Because he hath humbled her, he may not put her away all his days. So, here's a case. The damsel's a virgin. She's not betrothed. She's not set to be married. The man lay hold on her and they lay together and here one of those what we call in the in the south a shotgun wedding takes place okay you've lay together you're going to get married okay but what people will do with this is because of the context which this is written in they'll say oh so these men can just go and rape somebody and then they just get to marry them is this how it works but no, no no this isn't the same case if you skip over you're actually finding the opposite of the context of verse 23 and verse 24 where there was, there was a, a, a consensual laying with. He lay hold on her and lie with her. I think that, only, that doesn't indicate force. God might have used the word force if that was the case, if it was a rape. He specifically used forced her in the case of rape. Here is just lay hold on her. Just, just took hold of her. There might have been, okay, some coercion. Maybe the, maybe the, the, the man kind of convinced her. And, and that's the case sometimes in these scenarios where... Where, um, you know, you have like the innocent, um, let's say, virgin, Christian child that's kind of coerced by the like, you know, captain of the football team, punk, right, whatever, into giving up that chastity and that virginity, right? There could be a forcing or a laying with by, by coercion when he laid hold on her and lie with her. Um, but nonetheless, I think ultimately the act was consensual because ultimately the father accepts the dowry of that 50 shekels and they're just to marry one another. He humbled her. He, he performed the marriage act. It's not in the right order, but he ought to finish right. right. So the dowry takes place and the father gives up. I, don't, I, I cannot imagine a world where a father would, would receive a dowry and give of his virgin daughter if she was molested or raped by somebody. That, that, that doesn't even make sense practically speaking. So the Bible, the verbiage is, is, is pure here and it's true. It says, he lay hold on her and he lie with her. When it was found, the dowry took place. He had humbled her as a result of what had taken place and he must marry her and he must be with her forever. Okay, so this is not a case of rape, though the context might give you that um, indication. Um, you got to be careful about the verbs that are being used here. So the final verse, a man shall not take his father's wife nor discover his father's skirt. You can go to Leviticus 18 or Leviticus 20 on your own time if you need more details upon that. That's pretty clear. It's not taking your father's wife, whether it's the mom or whether it's the stepmom or whatever, to discover his father's skirt. I believe those are synonyms for the same act that's taking place. And that's what that is. All right. Thank you.